And so, you know, the call of the church is to be a radical community. Now, I don't mean radical in the sense of the radicalism we see, or sadly, on the news of extremism in that way, but as a community that is totally and utterly counter-cultural. And when I think about the word radical, I think about the Latin word radicalis, which is where we get our words like rooted from and radish, and to eradicate something, you're going right to the roots. So, a radical community is a community that is rooted wholly in Jesus. And if we get our roots down into Jesus, then you know what? The church and a nation can be totally transformed. And we get glimpses of this radical community in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. Let me just read chapter 4 and verse 32. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. You know what? We're getting towards the full number coming together to unite. But the full number were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him were his own, but had everything in common. It says the full number of those who believed. This radical community wasn't any old community. It was a community of those who believed this radical unity and radical generosity and influence was a result of people believing. But what I want to look at today is believing what? I remember when I spent a few months in France when I was studying theology. I had a placement there in Lyon, and many French people uh, who grew up, I suppose, in a Christian culture, they would have said to me, Jonathan, I believe, but I don't practice. I mean, can you really be a believer and not practice? Or when you're admitted to hospitals, you go up to the nobles there, they'll ask you to put on your sheet, you know, what, uh, as you sign in, are, you know, are you a Christian? Are you this? Are you that? Do you tick the box? I mean, are you really a believer if you tick the box Christian? But as we know this morning, only 5% will be in a local church on the Isle of Man. Is that what it means to believe? Or, or some would say, well, I was at a a meeting, even a Living Hope meeting, and the preacher preached, and I responded, and I put my hand up in the air, and I said all these things, and I prayed this prayer, but my life hasn't changed since. Is that really what it means to believe? Or is believing simply that you could sign a creed? The church has creeds, you know, that actually I believe I believe in creed. Well, it's interesting that James, writing in James chapter 1, 2, and verse 19, says something which is pretty scary for me, that, listen to what he says, you believe that God is one, right? You've got to write theology. (laughs) You do well. Even the devils or the demons believe, and they shudder. Okay, so what type of believing are we talking? What is authentic believing this morning? Because as I read the Bible, I have no doubt that God wants us to be confident that we know our sins are forgiven. God wants us to walk around with the confidence that we are His sons and daughters, that we have been reconciled to Him, that we have the free gift of eternal life. Let me tell you, God wants us to have that confidence this morning. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we might find mercy and grace in our time of need. So the way we live the Christian life isn't confidence in ourselves. It's going to be confidence in Jesus, but He wants us to be confident. Imagine the insecurity of a person who goes through life wondering, is this person really my parents? Imagine that. You know, you're you're doubting, I wonder, am I this person's son or daughter? I've never had a DNA test. There are things about my life which makes me doubt, what people are saying, what I'm feeling. Imagine going through life with that sort of doubt. Do they really love me? Am am I really part of their household? Will I share in the inheritance? (laughs) God doesn't want us to live that way. That type of insecurity must have huge negative ramifications in somebody's life. So today we're, we're looking at having this confidence and knowing indeed that we, how can we know that we are indeed sons and daughters from God? And we're looking at a letter, 1 John in the New Testament. 
And I suppose the whole purpose of the letter is summed up in 1 John 5, chapter, chapter 5 and verse 13. John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And that's where God wants us to be by the end of this message and this encounter with Jesus, that we'll leave this building knowing that we know that we're right with God, that we've been forgiven, that we have eternal life. I remember Andrew Selly telling me that for the first year after he received Christ, every single Sunday and when there was a gospel appeal, he would just come up like every, he just lived in that place of insecurity. And every single Sunday, it was like he was getting saved all over again and again and again. I mean, I suppose it did him no harm, but it's not, not a great place to live. God wants to speak so deeply into our hearts this morning that we would know that we have eternal life. Not, not a confidence in, well, I'm great, but a confidence in what Jesus has done. So why did John write this letter? Well, he wrote this letter because, well, there were people, voices speaking into the lives of the churches, 1 John 2, 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So there were voices coming into the heads of the church. Other people were trying to deceive the Christians that in order for you to really know, you needed to have this secret knowledge, right? This esoteric, this hidden knowledge. Or in order for you to really know that you have eternal life, you basically need to live a life of sinless perfection, right? So they were trying to deceive the church, and the church were wobbling. And as I said, God wants us to live securely in the love of our Father and to be believers who know. That's my message title, Believers Who know. Know that we have eternal life. Know that our sins are forgiven. Know that we're walking with Jesus. Know that we're co-heirs with Christ. Know that God is for us. And if you read 1 John, actually, there are three tests in this letter so that we really can know that we have this gift from God. And as I speak today, I want you to open up your hearts and and actually take part in this test. I know a lot of us don't like tests. I hated tests, right? When I did my GCSEs or O-levels, whatever they call them, I hated it. I got a U in my RE. <laughs> snap, beat, snap, exactly. I got a U in RE. Like, how, how qualified am I to speak here this morning? Like, U means like they just take one look at it and they bin it. Yeah, so. So we, we ha but actually this is the type of test that God wants us to do today to open up our hearts. And if you don't know for sure, then before you walk through these doors at a quarter past half twelve, after you've had your coffee and biscuits, that actually you've done business with God, yeah? You've done business with God. And you've got a new confidence. So let me look at these three tests. The first test is the spirit test. Listen to what John says, 1 John 4.13. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us. By this we know that we are living in Jesus and Jesus is living in us because He has given us of His Spirit. Okay, so the first test to know that we really have eternal life is that He has given us of His Spirit. We had an amazing six weeks as a family ministering into our partner churches all across southern Africa last July and August and into September. However, when we touched down in Cape Town, because we travel on Manx passports, we are as Manx as the hills. You do know that, yeah? Because we travel on Manx passports, there was a doubt, will we be able to get into Namibia without a visa? Now, the Namibian border is 700 kilometers away, and then we we're going to travel another 300 or 400 kilometers after that. So we had this idea. Let's go to the Namibian embassy in the center of Cape Town, and let's sit out once and for all. So we arrived in the Namibian embassy. They were lovely people. The Namibians are great people. And uh, they looked at the six of us, and Michael Uberb is with us, and they put us into this lovely boardroom for three hours whilst they sussed out. And, and by the way, after three hours, they came back and said to us, we phoned Berlin. Don't know why they phoned Berlin. But we phoned Berlin, and uh, we phoned this country and that country, and uh, we don't know. So just drive to the border. 
And uh, if they let you through, then you'll find out. Yes. <laughs> that's honestly, that's honestly what they, 700 kilometers, like you're driving. Anyway, so you could just tell that 700 kilometers was not fun, uh, the stress levels in me. And so as we were in this huge skyscraper, you know what, we could tell that uh, it definitely was Cape Town outside. I mean, you could see Table Mountain, you could see the Cape Town docks, you, you could see the Cape Town, you know, the flag of South Africa flying all over the place. But actually, in the Namibian embassy, we, we, we knew we were somewhere different. <laughs> because uh, you had the flags of Namibia there, you had the picture of the president, you had all sorts of beautiful photographs of the Namibian landscape. You know, outside was definitely South Africa, but, but inside it was a totally different kingdom right? Once we entered through the doors of that skyscraper, we were in a totally different kingdom. J Jacob Zuma may have been reigning outside, but in this building, in this place, in this dominion, there was a different president whose name I will not try to pronounce this morning. There was a different president who was reigning in that place. And that's the same. That's a kind of a picture of the Holy Spirit. When we believe in Jesus, he sends His Spirit to live within us. The kingdom of darkness is, is, is st still all around us, but, uh, but inside us is a new kingdom, and a new king is reigning, and that kingdom is going to expand in and through us. And that's how we know for sure that we are sons and daughters of the king. That's how we know we have eternal life. We know that we abide in Him and He abides in us because He has given us of the Spirit. That's how we know that we're sons and daughters of God. Yeah. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, Paul, an apostle, writes, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit of God dwells in His children. God is not a silent partner. His command and control center is established in our lives. And when you have the Spirit of God living in you, you know that you know that you know that you know that you know. Right? When the Spirit of God comes in, you, you can't help it. You know, I, I remember when I got married, I knew I was married. You know, things changed. You know, yeah, a lot of things changed. Things, you know, when you've got somebody else in the house, don't you know? Right. And when you've got somebody else in this house living with you, you know change is coming. Who, hands up, who got married and didn't change? Yeah, change is coming, yeah. Change is coming. You see, it's not simply knowing. is isn't simply, well, I put up my hand in a meeting, and I wrote it in my Bible, and I said something. No, no, it's far more than that. He's living in you. And the opening of the door of our lives, when we hear the knock of Jesus, means that the Spirit of Jesus comes into our lives, and a new king is in the throne room of our hearts, and a new kingdom is being established in and through us. So let me just ask you, first test, don't panic, we've got plenty of time, don't cheat by looking at your neighbor, but let me ask the question, has the Spirit testified with your spirit that you are saved? that you know, that you know, that you know. Is the Spirit like, oh my goodness, is the Spirit testifying with your spirit right now? I'm not saying, have you got a certificate from Living Hope or any other church to say that you went through a ceremony or, you know, have you written a date in your Bible? I'm not saying that because those aren't the biblical tests. But is the Spirit testifying with your spirit. I know, yeah. I know, I know that I know that I know that I know. Or are you still wandering around longing for a paternity test? But these are the tests today that you know that you're his son. Will you allow him to test you? 
The psalmist says, test me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So let him test you. Have you got the witness of the Spirit this morning? Okay, secondly, here's another test. The, the second test that John highlights that we know that we have eternal life, we know we're sons and daughters of the King, is the obedience test. You see, when we ge receive Jesus, it's not just about the externals and jumping through hoops, but He does transform us from the inside out. When the religious leaders caught the woman in adultery, Jesus protects her, and, and for His first words to her is, neither do I condemn you, but then He says to her, go and sin no more. His, his statement wasn't simply a command. His statement was empowering, go and sin no more. It was a declaration, this is how you're going to live. If you've truly encountered Me and the Spirit is dwelling within you, you're going to go and sin no more. So here is what John says, 1, two, 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6. Listen carefully. And by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. This is the obedience test. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments is a… is a… is a… is a… Okay, so whoever who says, I know Jesus, but doesn't keep His commandments, is a, a liar. And the truth is not in Him, but whoever keeps His Word in Him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way which Jesus walked. You see, the standard isn't the Ten Commandments. The, the level is to walk like Jesus. Now, obedience, doing the right thing, being a do-gooder doesn't make us Christians, but it's a sign that we are Christians. Yeah, you with me? For instance, James says, so also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. So the question we need to be asking ourselves is, am I bearing fruit? Since I've received Christ and the Spirit is dwelling in me, am I more loving? Am I more peaceful? Um, uh, is there more patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self? Is that those types of things starting to characterize my life? The fruits of Jesus dwelling in me, this person who's moved in and dominant, is, is this so now, dominant now, he's increasing, I'm decreasing. Is this person's life dominating and fruit dominating now, or is it just me? Michael DeFay, uh, who uh, is a great friend of ours and one of the elders in uh, Josh Jen, was, was telling this story about uh, the idols, you know, the American idols. Some of you maybe watched the TV series, and, and he was saying that some, um, if you watch um, Idol, some of the voices you hear are the worst you'll ever hear, but they have confidence that they're going to be America's next idols. You sometimes see that on the X Factor as well. They have convinced themselves that they have incredible voices, uh, but they have a false assurance. Journalists call them delusional standouts, and that's why we watch X Factor, don't we? and stuff like that, for the delusional standouts. They're the one that kind of makes it funny, yeah? And there's one guy, Keith, uh, and he's in the second series of American Idol, and he's singing Madonna. I'll not sing the song. But it's the worst rendition of uh, Madonna that you've ever heard. And so Simon Cowell says to them, you have the worst voice, not only in America, but the entire world. He's an encourager, isn't he? Yeah. And the guy looks totally shocked because genuinely he believed he had a great voice. It's kind of the look the pastors give me when I say, can I sing today? Yeah. That kind of, but this guy believed he had a great voice. Even his friends told him, you have a great voice. Yeah. But he has a false confidence. He thought he was one thing, but actually he was something else. And he measured himself according to his own and his friend's opinion. But he was wrong, and when he stood before the judges, 
he was exposed for being a false singer. I mean, if people had have loved him, they would have said to him, come on, don't embarrass yourself. Billy, no means. You know what? At the end of time, none of us want to stand before Jesus. You know, it says for, for elders in a church, we have to give an account for your soul. And none of us want to stand before Jesus and for any person who have come into a living hope congregation for them to to be a delusional standout at that stage. I thought I was. I mean, I attended church. I went to life group. I mean, I, I gave money maybe even, you know, but nobody, nobody should face that. And so the second test is the obedience test. Again, let me read to you from 1 John again. 1 John 3, 7 to 10. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning since the beginning. Now, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who the children of God, who are the children of God, and who are of the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now, the obedience test isn't that we are living a life of sinless perfection. We will only be perfect when we see Jesus, but rather the obedience test that we are not living in willful patterns of sin in our lives. And when we do sin, it, it grieves us. That's what John's getting at here. Let me tell you, you, you know that you're walking the, you're passing the obedience test, but when you do offend somebody, or actually there's just, oh my, I need to sort this out. I need to phone them. I need to apologize. I, I need to get right with them because the Holy Spirit's dwelling within you. In fact, John 1, I think it's 1 verse 8 or 18, says, if we think we have no sin in us, we're liars. So there's this tension. But the obedience test is when we come to know Jesus, the fruit of our lives starts to change. Uh, I have an apple tree in my garden, and it doesn't give apples like that. They develop, but you can see the fruit coming. So let's reflect on the second test. I know you don't like tests. I don't like tests. Let's reflect on the obedience test. Am I, is, is there that sensitivity to sin? It's not that you're, am I perfect, but, or am I just happy to go my way and just steamroller over people and have no conscience and I just, yeah, who cares what they think? Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Because he wants us to know. He, wants, he doesn't want anybody to leave this building not knowing and not making things right with him today. Yeah. Here's the last test, and that's the love test. You know, as we read in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, those who believed belonged. You know, there are 58 one and others in the New Testament. Encourage one another, help one another, pray for one another, love one another. But so in order to be an authentic follower of church, Jesus, you need to be in community. How are you going to do these one another's if you're not belonging and sharing life with one another? And so when the Spirit of God comes into our lives and, and Jesus starts dwelling within us, He gives us new desires, new godly desires, kingdom desires, and in addition, He not only gives us the desires, He gives us the power to live that way. And one of the desires that God gives us when we come to know Him is a love for the family of God. 
We are in a very individualistic uh, society. I have my iPhone. Pastor Chris has his iPad. You've got your iMac. Me, myself, and I. This is the culture. That we, it's all about you got the meal for one. I was, uh, anyway, I'm not going tangents, Jonathan. Tangents, Jonathan, don't go there. Meal for one. Do go there. Do go there. <laughs> you know, I was watching a program, Tangent, about the obesity crisis. And it talks about, how, you know, obesity crisis, how when microwaves came into domestic use, suddenly the obesity crisis went exponential. Because the whole, you can now make yourself this one big meal quickly, you know, this one meal, load of calories and load of unhealthy stuff and all that. Anyway, back to the message. But meal for one, individual, me, myself, and I. It's, it's about me and God and all this type of thing. But actually, you know, I am a masterpiece. I keep telling people, the Bible does not say that you or I are, are, are masterpieces. You got the Lincoln fridge magnets. I am his, tell yourself every day, every day, I am his workmanship. I am a masterpiece. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says we are his workmanship. I am just a broken piece of, of, of a vessel, a piece of pottery. But when God puts me together with you guys and fits us together, we become a work of art. Right? We, not me, myself, we become a work of art. And so God gives us these new desires. That's how you authentically know that you know that you know that you belong to Him, that you're believing not in vain, you're believing right. He gives us the new desires for the family of God, a deep love for others. God gives us a deep love for our brothers and sisters, and God gives us a deep love for strangers as well. So again, listen to the we know, 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because... We love the brothers. This wasn't an African church. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> they love the sisters as well. Yeah. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. In that movie, The Passion of the Christ, there's a scene which is shot specifically because just as Jesus is going to be put to the cross, nobody is forcing him at this, in this particular scene of The Passion of Christ. The cross is on the ground, and there aren't Romans holding him or Romans forcing him, but in the movie, you actually see him voluntarily laying his life down on the cross. That's what the Scripture says. Nobody, nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down. And the same is true for us. That's our calling. We love the brothers, and we love the sisters, and we love the strangers. We lay down our lives for one another. Do you love one another? How, are you, are you, I don't mean um, quiver in your liver. <laughs> Do you love one another? Are you laying down your lives for one another? another. Are you a Christ follower or are you just a religious humanist? <laughs> Think about what Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, as we've been reading in recent weeks, look like. Let me ask you, how do you know you've loved the brothers? Are you opening up your home and sharing hospitality with others? That's, that's what it looks like. Because Jesus just wants us to open up. <laughs> Number two, uh, do you find that you're starting to be filled with compassion towards people who naturally irritate you? There will be people in the church, we call them the Holy Spirit sandpaper. You know, God puts people around you, you're going to just take all those rough edges off you. So are you finding, because He's living in you, you're starting to have compassion for them? Number three, have you begun to give sacrificially of your time and your resources and, and laying them in the life of the church? And number four, are you organizing your calendar, and more importantly, your kids' calendar around the priorities of the church? <laughs> because we live in this age of the child-centered home rather than the Jesus-centered home. 
that when we do all the clubs, I think it's just parents don't want to spend time with their kids anymore. But this is a little outtake. I wonder, is that the case? I wonder, is that our real issue, why so many parents send their kids to clubs every single day? Because maybe you're not loving your kids the way you should. They want to spend time with you rather than going to clubs. I mean, not sending the clubs, but I'm just saying this whole culture of the child-centered home with a little child, you're, what do you want to do? Your time, any time, any place. <laughs> Are we ordering our priorities and our kids' priorities? Are we teaching them to put the king and his kingdom first? Are we? Can't do Wednesday nights because our kids do this. Well, is the king going to be first? And his kingdom? Or your current choices? Hmm. And lastly, fifthly, maybe, are you have you participated in meeting the needs? I love our life groups. Just speaking to one of uh, a life group member, not in any congregation that I've been a member of, one of our congregations this morning, he said, can't believe what's happened. This young man's grandmother died in recent weeks, and he said, I can't believe the love of the church. Family don't even go to Living Hope, just he goes to Living Hope. Two weeks meals, I think, they, he said, that the church have provided, sacrificially provided. Did they do the, the food at the funeral this week? I think the funeral was probably at the Roman Catholic Church, probably, yeah. Did the food for the family, everybody, the guests afterwards. Are you living sacri Is that the way you're living? That's the love test. You know, it's not about being a holy huddle because we do need to enlarge our world. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 46, 47, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles do the same. I love how Paul just ugh, reaches into our hearts in Romans 12 and 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints. That's to love your brothers. And then he says, seek to show hospitality. And we've been just ramming this home this year. That word hospitality is literally two Greek words, philo, xenos. You know where xenophobia comes from? <laughs> but philo is love, loving strangers. And actually, that, when it says seek to show hospitality, literally it means be inventive. How could you be more hospitable to strangers? Like Warwick, who was uh, in the Douglas congregation last week, he's an elder in a church in Northern Ireland. They've had a load of Syrian refugees coming in, obviously Islamic backgrounds. And over Christmas time, they opened up the church. They uh, made them meals, helped them celebrate. And all that. I mean, that's being inventive, isn't it? And we too need to be inventive. And how are we going to open up our lives and homes? and offer hospitality to people. This is, you know, I'm just saying, and why is this so important? Because this offering strangers hospitality, every time we do that, it's like marriage. Marriage is the prophetic picture when a husband and a wife come together. I mean, every time people look at that, that's God's creation ordinance of a man and a woman, a husband and wife coming together, and it's a picture of Christ and the church. And every time anybody's at a wedding, actually there's this prophetic picture which is... Whew, People don't even realize that, maybe in the most nominal of weddings, but there's this prophetic picture that God has put in a creation ordinance from the very beginning to speak to all of humankind. And every time you and I love strangers, it's also a prophetic picture from God. Because you know the Bible says God loved us and reached out to us when we were still aliens and foreigners and strangers when we were enemies from God. When you love, when you, that's why Jesus says, love your enemies. So every single time we just shower love and hospitality on people that maybe don't deserve it or people we don't even know, we just kind of seek to bless. Actually, we reveal the heart of God to our world. That's the love test. 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love that He laid down His life for us. So love is far more than a quiver in your liver. Love is about serving the needs of others. Look at who Jesus loved. Jesus loved His enemies. He loved those who shouted abuse at Him as He hung on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. He loved us when we were at our very worst. 
enemies, strangers, foreigners. Imagine if our churches knew Jesus intimately, right? And what was marking us out as churches was this distinct love for others and a distinct love for strangers. What a witness that would be to the world around us. And that is the primary way that Jesus wants to get the love out. <laughs> yeah. Let me conclude. John reaches in even further, almost finished. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him for whenever our hearts condemns us. So when our hearts condemns us because we actually are living this way, no, you can speak to your heart. No, I'm not going to be condemned. Yeah. God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. Amen. Is it right for me to have brought this message today about testing yourself, kind of making you feel uncomfortable? You know, sometimes people say, oh, Jonathan, just let us all be comfortable. I mean, I keep telling, I said to Douglas last week, no, I'm here to uh, afflict the comfortable <laughs> and the comfort of the afflicted, yeah. So, is this right? Is this right to even bring this message? Listen to what the Word of God says. 2 Corinthians 13.5 examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize about this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you fail to meet the test? So maybe as the band comes back, let me just ask you, have you passed these tests? Let's close our eyes. Have you passed the tests? Have you passed the tests? Let's close our eyes and come before God. Salvation comes through repentance, not remorse. Repentance means an about turn in our thinking and in our actions. Salvation comes in repentance and in faith in what Jesus has done for us on the cross. You know what? There's salvation in this house today. See the love that God has for us. So how can I have the biblical confidence that I really am saved, that I really am a Christian, that I really have been forgiven, that I really have the free gift of eternal life? That's just with our eyes closed. Let me ask you these questions. Do you believe and trust in Jesus as God and Lord with all your heart to save you? Do you really believe and trust in Jesus and what He's done for us? That's the first one. Second test. Heart. Spirit. Does the Spirit testify with your spirit that you are sons and daughters of God? Do you have that witness of the Spirit that you know that you know, I just know it. I, I know that I know that I know because the Holy Spirit is within me. The next, is there evidence that you're broken and repentant over sin? Is there, is there that evidence or do you just treat sin lightly like God will forgive me, like, you know, God will always forgive me so I'll just keep on rubbing it in His face. No, are you repentant and broken over your sin? And are you growing in your obedience to God? And then lastly, are you displaying for a love for God's people and for our world?